doing all right? Can we just be honest? Can we have a little confessional this morning at church? Uh, production team, amazing production team that makes this happen every week. Uh, said to me, said, hey, you got a stain on your shirt. And uh, I had some a bleach stain on my black shirt from cleaning my son's white sneakers. So we just took uh, a Sharpie, black Sharpie, and just filled it in today. So we're just putting this thing together. And don't be judging me. You got, you, got, you got toast crumbs on your shirt from eating breakfast watching church this morning. So we're in this together, messy or unmessy, and we're so glad you've joined us for church today. And uh, we hope you had an amazing week. And uh, we have been enjoying 21 days of prayer, praying every day for different things for our city, for our church, for your life, for my life. And we've been doing live streams during the week and uh, hope you've been encouraged by that. We're excited, as you just heard the announcement, we're excited to be back in person in two weeks. And it's limited. And I heard someone say this, it said, it seems like 2020 went, put on a wig, changed his name and came back. It looks a lot like, 21 looks a lot like 20. Um, we knew there was gonna be new things to navigate and tensions to manage, but we're down for it, you down for it. And we'd love for you to come back uh, in person if you're able to, if you're comfortable to, and we'll do the best we can to make it safe and uh, but make it awesome to be in church together. There's nothing like being in the room. And we're glad you're in the room today uh, online. Um, we're looking forward to hearing many of you, your voices in person, seeing your smiling faces and uh, being together in two weeks. So more information coming. Um, so just stay tuned for all that. Uh, did you have a good week? Hope you had a good week. And today I wanna to encourage you for a few minutes and I wanna pray. And uh, I honestly believe in the power of God's word. I believe in the power of worship, that worship time. Thank you, Curtis and Melissa and Sarah and Kim. Thank you for leading us. There are powerful in this moments. God is good all the time. But there are moments where I believe you can see God do exponential things in your life. And I believe church is one of those moments. I believe right now is one of those moments. And I believe God can grow your life. I believe God can step in. And I honestly believe this morning with the worship, but even what I'm about to share, can be life-changing, it can be spirit-growing, it can be sin-killing time in your life. I believe today will be one of those times that if you will uh, lean in and take the practical application and the spiritual transformation that God's Word promises, I honestly believe you can grow in your faith. And that's our journey. We say as a church that we are helping people far from God become close to God. And yes, we mean those that have never heard God's goodness, that are far from God, that, that uh, don't know his power and his forgiveness and his hope. But if I'm honest today, and if you're honest with your toast crumbs, I didn't forget, I know they're still there, just clean them off, is that there's parts of my life and your life where we're still far from God. And when we enter God's presence, I get closer to him. And my goal and our goal as a church is to help you this year and me this year end this coming year closer to God than when we started. I believe I, uh, I grew last year in my faith. I hope you grew in your faith. So today, if you lean in, we want to encourage you this morning. Do you have your Bible? If you have your Bible, I want you to turn to this morning, 1 John chapter 1. And you're going to see on the screen in a minute, 1 John chapter 1. I'm going to read a couple of verses, and I'm just going to encourage us this morning as we have church. And we're glad you tuned in live. Those that are tuned in right now live on Facebook and YouTube. And uh, those that are tuning in later on, uh, we're just so glad you took the time and we jumped on the comments to see so many from our church and so many people we don't know yet. And we're just really honored that you would come and spend time with us. And, some, and if you're sharing this on Facebook, thank you for sharing it. It's really the new way to invite people to church. And some of you are watching this today. You just woke up and someone that you know shared this and we're really glad. Really glad you've taken some time to tune in this morning. We're just a simple people that believe God loves us. He made us. He's helping us. And we believe that the same God that loves us loves you. Uh, 1 John, are you there? 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. I'm going to start reading in verse 8. It says, If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all wickedness. I'll go back to verse 8 because it's so good. It's so important. If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. This morning for this message, 
I want to talk in this title, Sorry, Not Sorry. Look at your neighbor, look at your, look, look at your family member across the room right now with that toast on them go, I'm sorry, I'm not sorry. Just sorry, not sorry. And we got some people in the studio today and you're going to hear their amens and you're going to hear uh, mostly my wife's laughter because if I can make her laugh, I have no problem with you. But sorry, not sorry. Can we pray today? Let's pray. God, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for church. Thank you that we gather in homes and at offices and in person. And we love you so much. God, we are aware that you have a plan, that you are good, that you're not just some, you're not just some, some, some heavenly being that is disconnected. You're not just some book of rules or history that, God, you are actively engaged in our story. And God, we need your help today. We have needs and we have dreams. And we know that you have plans for us. So God, we want to align our lives with you. Would you help us today, Holy Spirit? Would you do what only you can do? Can you reach through screens, through distraction and disengagement? Can you reach into my heart, the dark areas where I'm far from you? And can you do a miracle in our lives today? We love you, Jesus. And if you can help the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, we would appreciate that today. In, every, in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. What sayings, what sayings uh, need to be just canceled? What sayings need to be removed every year? The Urban Dictionary, they add uh, sayings. They, they, they add things that are part of popular culture. I believe there are some sayings that need to be removed from our lives. One is don't take it personal. Have you heard that before? People say, hey, they're about to tell you something. That, hey, don't, don't take this personal. And then they share something with you. Every time someone says to me, don't take this personal, and then they share what they're thinking, I've always taken it personal. Can't help it. It's like, don't take this personal. And then they get right up in my kitchen and share something. We need to remove that saying. The other one is not trying to be rude. And then they say something. Have you, have you, have you said that? Have you heard that? Someone's like, not trying to be rude. And then they just like, your breath stinks. You know, I, I'm not trying to be rude, but you are the worst preacher I've ever. I'm not trying to be rude, but, and every single time it's rude, isn't it? And I realize just because you say, I don't want to be rude, don't mean to be rude, doesn't mean it's, it's not rude. I just want to retire that. People just, it's, it doesn't get rid of it just because you say, I don't want this to be rude. It's still rude. Here's, here's one of my worst, the ones I hate the most is sorry, not sorry. Uh, I have a teenage daughter in my house and this is a saying that I've heard more than once and she is in the room right now and I'm not looking at it in her direction, but sometimes it's like, sorry, not sorry. And what you're saying when you say that is, I know it's wrong. I know it's hurtful. I know I shouldn't do it, but I think it's funny and I'm going to do it again. Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, no, I, 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 I ate that last dessert. Sorry, not sorry. No, uh, I know that I, you know, I, I wore your sweater and you didn't have it. Sorry, not sorry. I knew I took that last uh, Perrier out of the fridge. I'm sorry, not sorry. And when you say sorry, not sorry, what you're saying is I know it's wrong. And I probably shouldn't have done it, but I have no intention of stopping from doing it. I'm going to do it again. Sorry, not sorry. Some of you right now, you're going up with your third piece of toast. You're still on the toast. And you're like, I'm sorry, not sorry. It's so good. Church and toast were meant to be together. Sorry, not sorry. Today, uh, on our faith journey, there's this tension. And this is the tension that we have, is that we used to be sinners, far from God, many of us. But now we're adopted and we're saints. So we used to be sinners, far from God. But now we're saints, we're adopted. Once we became adopted by Christ, we are now called sons and daughters. We're not sinners. We're not strangers. We are actually adopted in this beautiful picture of we take on his name and his nature and his goals and his culture. And we are now saints. But here's the tension today. Because I know you and I really know me. Is though we are saints, we still sin. Oscar Wilde said it this way. He said, Every sinner has a future and every saint has a past. Isn't that true? Listen, if you're watching this and you're like, man, I'm a sinner, I'm far from God. My life is not holy, it's not like Jesus. I would not say that I'm living right. You have a future today. You have a future. Beyond this moment, beyond the weight, beyond the, the shame, beyond the mess, you have a future. Jesus died so you can have a future. God is good so your life can be but as saints today, we need to remember we have a past. 
And there's few things as dangerous as a saint that doesn't remember that he was once a sinner, doesn't remember his past. They become obnoxious. They become entitled. They become proud. I think we need to preach the gospel that every sinner has a future. But saints, I want to remind you today that you have a past. And that doesn't, we don't live in that past and we don't feel the guilt of that past, but it reminds us of the goodness of God and we are thankful every day. If you knew who I was, if you knew what I've done, if you knew what I've thought, you wouldn't want me to be your pastor today. And if I knew everything you ever thought, did, or said, I wouldn't want you tuning into our church today. What a great relationship we have. Thank God for his forgiveness. But here is the tension, is that we are sinning saints. We are adopted by God. We are saints. He is, we are his, but we still sin. We still sin, and that's a problem. And it's a tension we wrestle with. Not to talk about it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And I, I, I'm sorry I brought that up, but I'm not sorry. Sorry, not sorry today. I'm not trying to be rude, but there's some sin in your life. Don't take this personal, but you got some issues in your life. We are sinning saints. We still sin. Let me reread John chapter 9 from the message version today. The verse we just read. It says, if we claim that we're free from sin, we're only fooling ourselves. A claim like that is errant nonsense. On the other hand, if we admit our sins, simply come clean about them, he won't let us down. He'll be true to himself because we're his, we're adopted. He'll be true to himself. He'll forgive our sins and purge us of all wrongdoing. If we claim that we've never sinned, we out and out contradict God and make a liar out of him. Today, we've been going through some spiritual principles and we talked about silence. We talked about how God values the rhythms of our life. Today, I want to talk about the spiritual uh, discipline, the principle, the truth of repenting. I don't know if I've ever preached a sermon. I've preached about repenting. I've preached about forgiveness. But I don't know if I've ever gone into how to repent. Because here's the truth. You sin and I sin. We are saints, but we are sinning saints. We are, the Bible says that if we say we have no sin, we are liars. But see, God wants to help us. He's forgiven us for our past. He's redeemed us. And now we are, have entrance into heaven, but we still deal with the residue of the sin we were born in. And we still sin today. I want to give you, I want to give you today uh, how to deal with the sin in your life. Garbage day is a big day around our house. I've preached about garbage day. I don't know if it's recycling day and, and people make fun of me. I go and look at my neighbors and see what they're putting out. They're putting out the clear bags. They're putting out one of my teams like, you know, there's an app for that, that they can tell you if it's green bin day. And what, I'm pretty good at it this year. I'm really good at it. But there's been times in our marriage where I've not been good at remembering it's garbage day. And I'm driving the kids to school. We're running and we're gunning. You know what it's like. It's that scene from Home Alone when they're running through the airport. That's what every morning was like. And all of a sudden, you, you, you're pulling out of the driveway and you see your neighbor has his garbage out. You're like, I forgot garbage day. And when you forget garbage day, you only have two options. See, we all produce garbage doesn't matter where you live, how much your house is worth, and, or, or, or how nice you think life is. We all produce garbage. We all produce garbage. And when you forget garbage day, you only have two options. Number one, you leave it on the side of the road for two weeks till they come back and get it for everyone to see. Or well, the second option is you hide it. For us, it's our shed. We hide it in our shed. You have two options. Leave it where it is so everyone can see it, or you hide it. Isn't that like our lives? Some people, they're not trying to hide their garbage. You know those people, you, you're like, man, their life is a mess. The way they talk, the way they, the, what, they, what they watch, what they think about, what they're passionate about, where they spend their money. They're like, hey, my life is a mess. There's garbage everywhere. I treat people like garbage. I act like garbage. I watch garbage. I speak garbage. I just, my life is, and you're around them. You're like, man, your life is a mess. You ever, you ever meet those people? are like, dude, their life is a mess. Like, your relationships are a mess. Your kids are a mess. Your finances are a mess. Your thoughts are a mess. What comes out of your mouth is a mess. And you can leave it out there. But most of us don't do that. Most of us go for option two is we hide our garbage. And we just kind of hide it. And we put it in the shed. And then it starts building up. And people walk by going, I smell something. Like, what are you talking about? Like, no, nope, nothing to see here. Smile and wave, boys. Keep moving. There's no garbage here. I don't see any garbage. But something seems off around here. So many times in my life, I give off an aroma. You're thinking, man, looks clean, looks good. Something just seems off. You know what I'm talking about? Why? Because we're never meant to hide our garbage. We're meant to get rid of our garbage. The Bible calls that repentance. 
And today I want to walk through today of how to deal with repentance. Repenting keeps the house clean. Repentance takes the trash out of our lives. Sin, this is what sin is. Sin is not obeying God. Not obeying God. If God says do it and we don't, that's disobedience. That's sin. Sin is missing the very will of God. Can I just confess to you today some of the sins I break often? Some of you just leaned in. This is going to be really good right now. Like, oh no, I just shared this on my Facebook page. And now our pastor's having a meltdown. He's going to start confessing all his sins. Let me confess some of my sins. And maybe you do the same thing. The Bible says in Matthew 22, says Jesus said, love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. I break that one all the time. I, I sin there. I don't love God with all my heart, all my mind, all my life. I love him with parts of my life, parts of my finances, parts of my, 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 my thoughts, parts of my speech, parts of my passions, but not all the time am I all in, and that's sin. I think about the sin of, it says in Matthew 22, it goes on, it says, love your neighbor as yourself. I break that sin too. I, I prefer myself over others. I think about how that affects me. I think about what I want. I'm guilty of that. That's sin in my life. Philippians 2.14, it says, do all things without grumbling. I break that one. I am unclean. I am a sinner. That means grumbling inside and out. I, I might not say it. I might not complain on Facebook. I might not vent. But inside, I'm thinking it. And I walk in, I can't believe they did that. I can't believe I got to do that. I can't believe I missed garbage day. And, and my, my, my 16-year-old didn't think about it. I think about, I just grumble. I, I grumble about this. I grumble about that. Maybe I'm not the only one today, but it's a sin. 1 Peter 5, 7, it says, cast all your anxieties on him. I sin there. I, I don't do that. I carry my anxiety. I worry about stuff that I can't change. And I, I get anxious. And the Bible says to cast it, and I carry it. And it's a sin. Ephesians 4, it says, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up. I fail that one all the time. I say things that maybe tear people down. I say things that maybe... Uh, it isn't encouraging to everybody. And sometimes what comes out of my mouth isn't bringing life but death. Sometimes I bring things out that just makes people worse, not better. And I know none of you ever do this. I'm just having a confessional moment right now. I know none of you do this. Those here, in, in, they're just, I, I'm surrounded by angels in this place. But, but me, I got some issues. And I'm on a journey. But I got some garbage in my life. And the Bible makes a way for us to get rid of the garbage. It's called repentance. Because the Bible says that we sin. We're saints. We're adopted by God. We're accepted by God. We don't need to earn it. But when that garbage gets building up, we need to not hide it or display it. We need to remove it. And that is repentance. You've all seen the illustration maybe about repentance and it's about a 180 degree turn. Have you seen that before? It's, and, and I've seen this my whole life that repentance is you're walking this way and uh, you're going towards something. You're going towards a habit or a thought or a relationship or a future that you know is far from God. And you start walking towards something. And true repentance is when you do a 180 degree turn and you go, no, no, I'm not walking towards that anymore. I'm going to walk away from it. That's repentance. Repentance is not just saying you're sorry. Repentance is actually a change of direction. The where you were going, what you're going towards, what you are focused on, true repentance is to turn. I've heard that my whole life, but today I want to give you, I want to give you six points on how to repent. Because we all want to change direction. We all want to see a change. I want to give you today five ways, five ways uh, to truly repent and how to help you to get that garbage out of your life. Today, I believe you can grow. Number one is ask God to find the garbage. Ask God to find the garbage in your life. Psalm 139, verse 23. The author here, David, saying, Search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Here's the problem. Because we have sin, we can't gauge ourselves. There's that saying, only God can judge me. And there's so much truth in that. Only God can evaluate you. Only God can do inventory. Only God can search you. Because if I search myself... I'll search myself based on my intentions, not my actions. Well, I never meant to say that. I didn't want to hurt. I only said that to be funny. Only God can search our hearts. The Bible says, ask God to find the garbage. He'll show you where you need help. I like it this way. There's a difference between how I clean the house and how Nancy cleans the house. Yes, 
My wife just said amen. See, when I clean the house, it's because we've got company coming. And, we, and if you ever come to our house, you need to know. There's been a lot of effort. We may look like, oh, oh, hey, we're glad you're here. But there has been a deep clean and a frenzy in our house. There is cleaning happening that I feel is unnecessary. And when I clean the house, Nancy's like, she'll text me, so-and-so's coming over. We got your parents coming over. We got friends coming over. Clean the house. And she knows when she asks that, that there's going to be a level of clean that is up to Mike Miller's level of clean, not Nancy's level of clean. See, I, I clean it that you walk in and go, this place is clean. But Nancy's like, no, no, but what, like, what about the radiator? Like, there's hair on the radiator. Didn't you not see that? I'm like, I'm thinking, I'm thinking the big stuff. And I, I said to her one day, I was like, listen, if they can't see it, you don't need to clean it. I'm like, throw it in closets. Come on, somebody. You know what I'm talking about. Under the bed. We all have that junk drawer. You know, everything's in the junk drawer. There's like notepads and pens and spatulas and kids. Like there's things in the junk drawer. We all have a basement we don't talk about. Come on, somebody. That, that one room, just throw it in the closet. I was like, if you can't see it, we don't need to clean it. Nancy's like, is that how you do your self-hygiene? <laughs> you don't need to clean it if you, people can't see it? I'm like, you got a good point there, right? Because what if we live that way going, if you can't see it, I don't need to clean it. I'm going to wash from here up and we're good. There's a difference on cleaning based on standards. And when I try to clean my life based on my standard, it is far less than what God, God wants to go into every area of our life and clean us. Because the goal is not for the approval of men, but for the holiness of God. God wants to clean us today. God will show you, listen, we've been doing nothing at noon. Many of us have been praying. Some of you do it in the morning and some at night, but it's a silence. Silence, no phone, nothing. Can I encourage you? Let's just go to another level today. When you spend that time with God and get in silence, ask him, go, God, search my life. Not based on culture or trends or the government or Facebook or blogs say is holiness or approval or right. Well, you know, I only got a little bit of, racism in my life. I only got a little bit of pride in my life. I only got a little. Let God search our lives. Ask God to search you. Number two, how do you repent? Good grief. Good grief. You ever said that? Good, good, good grief. There is a good type of grief. All grief is healthy, but there is a biblical grief in repentance. It says in Psalm 51 verse 16, says, you do not desire a sacrifice or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You do not reject a broken and repentant heart, oh God. We're not talking. The Bible's not talking about shame or condemnation of the enemy going, you're never going to make it. You, you can't get past this habit or this sin. You're not worthy to be adopted. You should st stop this faith journey. It's not a putting a heaviness on you, it, 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 but a godly grief. It's a, it's a mourning, the loss of connection with God. Wow. See, nothing can separate us from God wow. but sin. And it says even his son Jesus, when he put the sins of the world on him, it said even God had to turn his face. And he said, why have you forsaken me? Why? Because God is repelled by sin. And when we sin, the grief that I need to feel is the loss of connection, the distance. You were never meant to have a long distance relationship. Zoom is good for friends, but not for heaven. Texting is great for relationships, but not for your divine connection. And when we grieve, what we're grieving is that separation, that loss of connection. That is good grief. And to be honest, this is the attitude that is missing in most repentance. And it's the very thing God is trying to teach us. Sorry, not sorry. I won't do it again. Just remind me, help me. Accountability partners. I just want to be good. Like, just, I'm just, I won't do it again. I'm good. And sometimes, many times in our lives, we don't have that grief of missing that connection. That grief of, 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 of feeling the distance between us and God, God's presence leaving our life. In true repentance, you ask God to find it in your life and search you, but then you start to grieve the loss of connection. And in that connection is where there are moments of miracles. When God wants to bless you and use you to be a blessing to others. Listen, I believe there is so many moments of opportunity I've missed to be a blessing to this generation and the next 
Not because I wasn't called, not because God hadn't given me skills and talents, but because I wasn't close enough to hear his direction because I had put distance between me and him with the sin in my life. And I grieve that. Oh God, what if you wanted to use me? God, what if you had a, wanted to warn me and I, we need to grieve today? Grieving. Grieving the loss of connection. I have friends even during this year that have been a part of their lives when they've lost a loved one and there's a healthy grief and it's saying, I just miss their relationship. I miss the closest. I'm going to miss the stories. One of our team here, loss of a grandparent and find that this grandparent wrote poems and I'm going to miss the humor and the writing. And When we grieve in repentance, we're missing that connection to God. Does God seem far today? Does God seem distant? I'm talking to you saints today. I believe there's a grief that needs to come in, a broken heart. God doesn't desire us to just rhyme off prayers or, or you, can't, you can't get it back through offerings or singing or sharing the stream, but there's a grief that needs to come in. He desires a broken heart, not a broken life, but a grieving of missing that connection. Number three, put a face on it. How do you repent today? Put a face on it. One of our biggest obstacles to real repentance is seeing rules, not relationship. I do this. I just, I see this book as a book of a list of rules going, ah, I blew that one. I'm doing okay in that one. Didn't do so well in that one. And I believe this is really one of the the main struggles in Christian faith. The The greatest threat to our faith is not another religion. It's not atheism. It's not paganism. It's not culture. It's a form of Christianity, a form of godliness, but denying the relationship, the power. And you got to put a face on it. Sin is less about the rules we, we break, but it's more about the one we disappoint. See, God will always love you, but he's not always proud of you. Yeah, you heard that right. You can't make God love you any more than he loves you right now. It's impossible. Some of you feel far from God. You feel like your life is a mess. Man, the stuff that's going, you're putting into your body and into your mind, your life is a mess. God will never love you more than he loves right now. He loves you so much. Some of you feel like you're just crushing it. 21 days of prayer, devotions, loving God. Do you know what? He doesn't love you any more than he did when he found you. God cannot love you anymore. But you can disappoint God. That's why Jesus, God's son, he says, this is when he got baptized, he said, this is my son, which speaks of love. He's like, there's a relationship. I love this boy. But then he says, who I'm well pleased. He added that. Why? Because love and approval aren't the same thing. And sometimes I disappoint God. He loves me so much, but I disappoint him. I've done that to my parents. My kids have done that to me. I always love them, but sometimes in relationships, you disappoint. And sinning is less about the rules we break, and it's more about the one we disappoint. I never forget as a teenager, my mom, uh, I, I was a teenager once. I tell my son and daughter this. I was you at one point. I remember I would, I would break the rules of our house. And uh, my, mom, my mom would just say the worst thing to me, the most cutting thing to me. Here's what she'd say to me when she found out I broke the rules. She'd say, I'm just so disappointed. I'm like, that's the worst thing you could say to me. I'd rather you smack me. I'd rather you beat me. I'd rather you ground me. I'd rather you take away the car and privileges. But don't say I disappointed you because it was such a moment of ah. Oh, Loss of relationship. I never forget there was this one girl that I liked in high school, and she wasn't good for me. Uh, my mother called, didn't call her by her real name. I think she called her Delilah or Jezebel or something. But there was this one girl, she wasn't good for me, and my mom's like, I don't want you hanging out with her. I was like, okay, mom. She said, here's why. You're too young to date. You need to focus on this, and there's some things I don't think is healthy. And I said, I agree with you. Okay, I get your point. Yeah, okay, I won't. And then one Saturday morning, I snuck out of the house at 8 a.m. and took this girl for breakfast at McDonald's. That's right, big spender here. That's me. This is only the best. We, you know, we went for hot cakes and sausage at McDonald's. And uh, someone from church walked in and saw us having breakfast and said to my mom later that week, oh, it was so good to see Mike with Delilah. That's not her real name. But, uh, and mom's like, she pulled me aside. I go, I thought you, I thought. And she said, I'm just so disappointed. So disappointed. Listen, you got to put a face on it. The prodigal son in scripture, who, the, the son who had walked away from his father, disobeyed him, went and lived a wild life far from the culture and values. It says he came to his senses. And it says when he came back, he, re, he was repenting. He was asking for forgiveness. He was changing his life. Watch this. It says in Luke 15, 21. 
Watch what he says. This is a man that is truly repentant. We use it as an example of repentance. He was grieving. He was, he, was, he was looking at his life. He was seeing where there was garbage. And he comes back in Luke 15, 21, and he walks up to the Father and he says, I have sinned both against heaven and you. I'm no longer to be called your son. Notice he didn't say, I broke the family values. Notice he didn't say, I broke our Jewish culture. He said, I sinned against you. He put a face on his sin. I want to encourage you today. When we, when we, when we, walk away from God's best. It's not just the rules we're breaking. It's the person we're disappointing. You've got to put a face on this. This is not a faith journey that deals with next steps and reading your Bible and devotional plans. There is a person of Jesus Christ who loves us so much and he's actively invested in our journey. He died for us. He is cheering for us. He is fighting for us. And that is the one we want to please. And when you do that, you put a face on it. It changes everything got to put a face on our repentance. You have to follow Jesus, not the rules. You can quote me on that. We're not following rules. If you follow Jesus, I'll have no problem with the rules. Well, but, but what, what does the rules say? Like, how much is too much to drink? Well, how, well it only had that many swear words in it, that, that movie. But you know, like, it's just a little flirting. Show me the rules on flirting. Show me the rules on consumption. Show me, listen, if you follow Jesus, you don't need the rules. It's funny, I, I never go back to my marriage vows. I love my wife. I follow my wife. I don't need to follow something that was written for me 20 years ago. If I, follow, if I, if I, if I love my wife, I'll follow the rules. Can I encourage you? We're not here to follow the rules. We're here to follow Jesus. And that changes everything. Put a face on it today. Number four. Almost done today. Don't be entitled. True repentance doesn't expect forgiveness. The prodigal son, it says he came back to his father, and this is what he said. He's like, I know I can't be your son anymore. I'll just be a servant. Give me a job to do. I'll, I'll work in the field. I'll work in the kitchen. I'll take garbage out. Listen, I, I know I've blown it. I know I've walked away. I'm not expecting to come back into the main house and to be, have authority and be a boss. I just, I just want to be a servant. That is the heart of true repentance. It's not entitlement. He came back expecting to be a servant, not a son. Listen to me. We know God for, is going to forgive us. We know that we are sons. But when we have that attitude of, I can just keep sinning because he's going to forgive me. Sorry, not sorry. Entitlement. Listen, so many times in scripture, God forgave. Sometimes his spirit left. And God valued and loved and accepted, but there wasn't always the same level of restoration to what they could have done. I think about Samson. I think about others. Listen, I want you to know this is that when we sin, we're not entitled going, you have to forgive me. You said, you know, you're, you're as close as the mention of your name. There is this sense of, oh God, I am so thankful. See, you can have a lot of stuff and not be entitled. My kids aren't entitled. My kids aren't perfect, but they're not entitled. I think about my son, how humble he is. He's like, is it okay if my kids still ask us for things? And we tell them, whatever is ours is yours, but they still ask why. When you're entitled... You don't ask, you just take. I'm just going to take forgiveness. I'm just going to take restoration. When you're not entitled, when you're humble, you're like, God, would you forgive? Would you? True repentance isn't assuming. It's asking. Ask God for forgiveness. Number five, last one today. It's going to help you. It's helped me change your behavior. That's the last step for true repentance. Change your behavior. Like I said, it's a 180 degree turn. That means if you're walking towards something, once you ask God to search you and go, this isn't right, once you start to grieve, really grieve, put a face on it. Understand, it's not assumed that God's just going to put you back where you belong. It's not assumed that everything's going to be okay. It's not assumed that he's just going to smooth it over and erase it. Once you understand that when he does grant you forgiveness and hope and restoration is a gift, you turn. Listen to me. 
That means you walk away from that relationship that's going to destroy your marriage. That means you walk away from that series that is sliming your mind. That means you walk away from those conversations that build anxiety and pride and strife. It means you walk away from the disunity in that friendship. It means you walk away from the abuse of someone who thinks they can just keep slandering you. And there has to be a change of behavior. You just can't keep doing the same thing. If you need to move provinces, move provinces. If you need to change jobs, change jobs. If you need to cancel your cable and internet, you cancel it. Because it's not about rules. It's going, I am so desperate for change. I'm going to turn, not just for a day. I'm going to run to the opposite direction because that's where my hope lies. Change of behavior. Change of behavior. Even this last week, I realized some behaviors in our family's lives where we just were distracted. Like, how bad is that? Distraction. Distracted driving kills. Distracted walking, you can get hurt. Distracted faith, you can miss out. And we just made some changes in our schedule. Actually go the opposite direction to make room for God. Can I encourage you? Repentance means you actually change your behavior. Change it today. Here's the promise today as I close. Here's the promise. I go back to 1 John 1, 9, where we're all starting. It says this, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us for our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You hear that? If we confess our sins, not if you've sinned, if you confess your sins, because we all got garbage. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our, our sins and to cleanse us, clean us. His clean is better than OxyClean or Tide Pods. Better than magic eraser, Norax cloths, the, the, the green one or the purple one or the pink one. He's better than all that to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And listen to me today. There is nothing like the peace, the joy, and the hope that comes from being clean in God. When I feel clean, it's amazing how anxiety many times washes off of my life. It's amazing how Anger washes off of my life. Frustration washes off of my life. When we confess, he is just to cleanse. And there's nothing more hopeful and peaceful and joyful than being clean before God. Could it be the joy you're looking for, the peace you're looking for, the hope you're looking for today is found in a life that's right before God? We're sinning saints. We got to take the garbage out and repent today. You feeling distant? You feeling anxious? You feeling heavy? Repent. It's a part of our faith journey, just like communion and prayer and worship and giving. Repentance is a daily thing. We don't judge you for your giving. We don't judge you for your worship. We don't look down on you for your faithfulness in prayer. It's the same thing with repentance. We all need to repent. And could it be the distance you feel will be fixed in the repentance you need? Watch God. Won't he, won't he rush in in his faithfulness and clean you today? I want to pray for you today. Church, I want to lead you in a prayer. You say, Mike, I just, I love Jesus. I'm a saint. I'm adopted. I love God, but I feel far from God. I feel distant. I feel anxious. I feel unclean. I feel like there's some hidden garbage in the shed of my life. I feel like there's some things that's giving off an aroma. I can't hide that broccoli smell no more. I can't hide that, that I can't hide those leftovers no more. And there's things that I haven't dealt with for months, years, days, decades. Today, just let God do what he does if we do what we do, which is repent. Can I lead you in a prayer of repentance? Let's pray. God, I thank you today that you are close as the mention of your name. And today, God, we ask you, would you search our hearts? Every man, every woman, every child, every husband, every wife, every teenager, God, would you just search our hearts right now? Search our hearts. Not on what people can see, but God, every part of our lives, would you search our hearts? And God, we grieve where we've maybe led a, a revolt against connection, where we've disconnected, we've purposely walked away from connection with you. God, we put a face on it today. We're not, we're not grieving rules. We're not... We're not, we haven't disappointed a system or a church or a pastor, but God, we have grieved you. We have sinned against you. Oh God, we're so thankful. We're so thankful, God, that you'll forgive. And you don't have to forgive. We don't expect you just to ignore it, but God, we're so thankful today that you are good and you promised restoration and forgiveness. And God, we pray you'd help us change today. Help us change. The way we talk, what we, what we think, where we go, 
who we do it with, God. We, we want your plan more than we want our sin. And God, we pray for right now that you would wash us with, with, with cleanliness. You'd wash us with peace and hope and joy and forgiveness. In Jesus' name. Real quick today, if you're watching this, and you're like, I don't know God. I don't know Jesus. I'm not a saint. I'm still that sinner, but I'm believing preacher that I have a future. I, I don't know Jesus. I've never given my life to Jesus. I've never had those adoption papers where heaven said, he's mine. Today, the Bible says that if you confess with your mouth and just say, I need Jesus. I, I, want, I want forgiveness. I want hope. And you believe in your heart that God made you and has a plan for you and can wash away your sin and you can start a relationship with Jesus, a miracle happens. Can I pray for you? You'll see a text on the screen. If you text that, that word faith right now to that number, 902-903-2682, just text that. Uh, we'll agree with you in prayer, but can I pray for you? You might be watching this anywhere in the world right now. Can I pray for you? If you're like, Mike, I need to start my relationship with Jesus. I want to have that. I want to be able to repent. I want to be able to be forgiven. I want to have a future. Let me pray for you. So, Lord Jesus, I pray for those watching today. Would you repeat this after me if that's you today? Whether you want to shout it or whisper it, say, Lord Jesus. Come on, say it with me. Lord Jesus, I need you. Forgive me. Help me. Lead my life. Reconnect me. I need you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you so much for that. You love Jesus today? Friends, go. Repent and sin no more. It's going to be an amazing week. We'll see you tomorrow night on the live stream for prayer. And we love you so much. And we're going to see you in two weeks in person. God bless you and have an amazing Sunday.